Come on, right where you are. Just raise up a worship where you stand now and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Lord of all. Lord of everything. Lord of my house. Lord of my money. Lord of my family. Hallelujah. He's won the victory just for you. Hallelujah, you have won the victory. Hallelujah, you have won it all for me. Come on, there's 
Chronicles chapter 32. Very familiar passage to some, but there is some new, fresh anointing in there for others. Second Chronicles chapter 32. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version of the Bible. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. 
When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he had intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside of the city. And they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square of the city and of the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said to the people. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought. Rejoice! The odds are still in your favor. Rejoice, the odds are still in your favor. What happens when you have been dealing with the spirit of fear and you prayed for fear to go away, but you find yourself still dealing with fear? And since you're a good Christian, you're standing on, you know, 2 Timothy 1 and 7, excuse me, 1 Timothy 1 and 7, and you're saying, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind, but the fear keeps coming. What happens when you pray for your wayward child to come back to the Lord? And I mean, you get on your knees and you stand on the promise in Proverbs 22 and 6, where God said, train up a child in the way he should go. And when they get old, they will not depart from it, but it looks like they're going further and further away. What happens when you ask God for the desires of your heart and you're standing on the word of God for mate, Psalms 3 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, but your desires don't seem to be coming. What happens when you tithe and give and so, and your money problems don't get any better. Here you find yourself standing on Malachi 3 and 10. If you bring all the tithes into my house, said the Lord, uh, and prove me, make sure there's meat in my house. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. What happened? You haven't gotten your blessing. As a matter of fact, you're still waiting on a window to open up. To pay your bills. What happened? This is not a trick question. This is not a quiz. In reality, I don't even want you to answer because the average Christian out there understands that the only answer to all of those scenarios is that we have to keep holding on. Isn't that right? We just hold on and press on. But this is not one of those let's hold on messages. This is a message that said there's some things you need to understand before you go further. It's not just about holding on, it's understanding what's going on. See, the average Christian, when they go through those situations that I just named, most of them feel like giving up. Be honest, most of them have, feel like something's wrong with me. Most of them feel like, um, look like God is not being fair. Sometimes they say, why is God allowing this to come to me? Now I just told you that we know there's no answer but to hold on, but we sure get ourselves in this situation where we just don't understand why all of this is coming. And the reason that we find the church in the mess that it's in, we find saints who understand that there are going to be these periods, these times. The problem is most of the preaching out there is a preaching that starts with the problem and then quickly 
goes to the outcome, but focuses nothing on the middle. What I'm saying is that a lot of the preaching that we are feeding people out there now tells them there's a problem, God's going to solve it, and they get to the point that's all they believe. They don't, nobody tells them to focus on the fact that you still have to deal with the stuff that's going to happen to you while you're waiting. You still have to deal with your emotions going up and down. You still have to battle some fears. You still have to struggle. What I'm saying is I call this the gospel ease preaching. It's where it's that fairy tale preaching. It's that happily ever after preaching. You got a problem? God's going to get rid of it. But nobody tells you it don't work like that. It's not always that easy for something just to disappear. Here's what they tell you. That when I call, when I declare and decree, when I call on the Lord, when I, when I tell God what I need, when I name it, when I claim it, when I surely repent and tell him that I need him to come down, God is supposed to shoot down from heaven, come right now and bless me. And you know what we're finding out? That's just not true. That's not biblical preaching. As a matter of fact, that's detrimental preaching to the kingdom of God to try to tell people that something's just going to happen just like that without you having to go through anything. That's the message I want to talk about today. That's the problem I want to make sure you understand that it is not going to be that easy. Somebody told you that you never have to go through, and you're sitting there saying, what's the matter with me? I keep doubting. I keep having fears. I fall down. I get back up, and I fall down again. What's going on with me? What I'm seeing is, these, why can't I be like those other Christians who seem to have it all together? That's the lie. There is no Christian that got it all together. All of us are going through the same thing. All of us are struggling and fighting, and all of us are dealing with doubts. Come on, somebody testify. All of us are trying to figure out, how did I, how am I saved so long and still got to struggle? Because the struggle is a part of our walk with God. What I'm telling you, there, here, here's the good news. There are no super Christians out there. There are no saints that are just getting delivered. Don't let them fool you. There is nobody that does not have to go through the same stuff you are going through. Somebody needs to tell somebody, no, nah, there's going to be some hard times even when I get delivered. What are you saying, Pastor? Find somebody who testifies, I'm a cancer survivor. Ain't know what happened? And they say, yep, I, I, passed, I got through my cancer and I rang that bell. Okay, but when you rang the bell, I dare you after we get done clapping, and yay, they're a cancer survivor. I dare you to sneak them off to a corner somewhere and have a private conversation and let them tell you how they got their deliverance. You know what you're going to hear? They're going to tell you about the long, dark nights. They're going to tell you about the days when most of their day or the majority of their day was pushing back the fear of what was going to happen to them. They'll tell you about the times when their emotions were going up and down and their mind felt like it was about to leave. Is that what a Christian is supposed to do? That's the part I'm trying to teach you today. That's the message that you need to understand. No matter what you go through, the odds are going to be against you, but the odds are still in your favor if you go into this thing with your eyes open. I'm going to have to get through some stuff. Let somebody testify. Uh, God stepped up and paid my mortgage. Good. Okay. Let me, and you know what? Tell them. And now we're not evicted. The Lord saved us. But pull them aside and ask them, well, how'd you get there? And they tell you about the days when they were struggling, wondering, is there still going to be a roof over our head? Or the fear that shot through their heart every time the phone rang. Or they were worried about what was going to happen tomorrow. Don't let anybody fool you. Here is the shout. Everything you go through, the odds are going to be against you. They're going to be overwhelming. You can't look at the odds, but you also can't look at some snap, pap, snap, crackling, pop kind of Christians. That is fake news gospel. That is alternative facts gospel. That's fairy tale gospel. The reality is you're going to have to stand up. Listen to me, somebody. Fight back. God brought you here so you can hear this. None of us are sitting there where we're so, so we made it so far that we don't have to stand up and fight through everything that we need from God. Fake preachers will tell you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the fiery furnace. 
the fourth man showed up. They weren't burned. The clothes didn't even smell like smoke. All of those are good, but can you please tell me what was their mindset when they went in that fire? I'm in the fire now. I, I need to know, did they think maybe I should bow? Or did they attempt? Look, I know the Bible doesn't tell us that because we want to focus on all the other stuff. We want to treat biblical char ca characters and those who've been delivered as if they were some robots and puppets. No, they had emotions and feelings just like us. Here is the good news. I'll say it again. I'm going straight to this text. The good news is that, yes, the odds are going to be against you. Every time you go to get delivered from something, it's going to be overwhelming. But don't worry. Rejoice because the odds are still in your favor. Because God is on your side. Rejoice because the odds are still in your favor. But I want you to rejoice and know, even though the odds are in my favor, I'm still going to have some up and down days. Anybody getting something out of this? I'm still going to have some struggling nights. I might shout today and cry tonight and have to hold on to a scripture. That's the reality of understanding. The odds may be against me, but I can rejoice because... The odds are still in my favor. Go back to what I opened up with, the fear. So say you're walking around uh, and fear still has you after you pray fear away. You don't have to worry because 1 John 4 and 4 tells us that even though the fear is there, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. The odds are always in my favor. Say you prayed for that desire and prayed for that wayward child and the wayward child seems to be getting worse. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is understand Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who can be against us? All you have to understand when you pray for that desire of the heart, looks like those desires aren't coming. All you have to remember that with man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All I'm telling you is when you have to stand and worry about paying your bills and your money, please hear me. You need to make sure you understand 1 John 5 and 4. That which is born of God overcomes the world. We are overcomers. Somebody need to rejoice, but somebody need to tell somebody, I didn't get through this thing easy, but I sure learned how to shout and give God glory for the things that I've been through. Here is our example today. Hezekiah. In this text, he gives us principles to understand that no matter how many odds are against us, and no matter how bad it looks, it's going to look bad. No matter how bad it sounds, it's going to sound bad. No matter how bad it is, it's going to be bad. But as long as I got God on my side, the odds are still in my favor. Somebody need to take a praise break right there and just understand that you came to understand, yeah, things look bad, the pressure is happening, but the odds are still in your favor. Hezekiah faced an overwhelming situation. Can you go with me to Hezekiah and understand something? This is one of the most devastating attacks we find scripturally on someone who was living for the Lord. And we find out that Hezekiah found himself under attack. Have you ever been under attack? Hezekiah found himself under attack. And the attack was coming relentlessly. And he was the one serving God. I'm going to lift up three things off of this text. You know, I like to tell you where I'm going. Everybody preaches the way they need to preach. But my homiletics tell me, I'm going to tell you where I'm going so you know when I get there. First thing I want you to know, if you're going to stand through those times when the odds are overwhelming you, but you know that the odds are still in your favor. You got to keep believing, but keep on working. Keep believing, but keep on working. If you're going to stand when the odds are against you and you know the odds are still in your favor, you have to keep trusting, but watch out for the tricks of the enemy. Watch out for the deceptions, the tricks that will come along. So you gotta keep on believing, but keep you gotta keep on believing, but keep working. You gotta keep on trusting, but watch out for the tricks. And you gotta keep on praying and praising and look for God's providence in your life. Look for his providence. Let's talk about it. The book of first and second chronicles. In reality, they are one book. In our Bible, they are divided, there are two books but they were really one book in the original canonization. 
So they put the books together, and we have First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles follow First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, and repeats a lot of the information in both of those books. But the difference is, you got to understand, there's a different slant. Chronicles is a book that still tries to focus on the hope of the Messiah coming, and Chronicle focuses on how God is utilizing, and it deals with genealogy to show that the Messiah is coming through the lineage of David. So First Chronicles is a lot about David, and, and Second Chronicles uh, about Solomon, and then we have Second Chronicles, which talks about the kings of the of the southern kingdom, uh, Judah and Jerusalem, not the northern kings, because he's trying to concentrate on the lineage of David. That when you look at all that genealogy, you think it doesn't mean anything. But what it's saying to you is God keeps his promises because it can show you how God never misses. He has everything laid out. Oh, I wish I could stop there. God has everything laid out for you. And if you look at it, you've heard this because what, what the second king starts out with is all of those kings who were disobedient and obedient. And we found out that the majority of them were disobedient. And because of their disobedience, they fell. But when they were obedient, they were okay. Right now, you need to understand it is the same way today. Some of us want deliverance, but don't want to be obedient. What I'm telling you is you can't sit there and wonder why my deliverance hasn't come when I won't line my life up to be obedient to God. Hear me? You can't sit around and be out of sync with God's word and think deliverance is going to continue to come in your life. No, what Chronicles is telling us that there's a balance from God that he blesses obedience. He blesses obedience. You want to know what you got to do? You got to make sure you invest in yourself so that the obedience that comes will render you a blessing down the road. You can start looking for your blessing once you stand in obedience. I don't know what it is. I don't know what may have you out of kilter this morning. I don't know why you haven't gotten your deliverance. Here's what you need to understand. Maybe it's the fact that you're serving God, but you still got pride in your heart. Maybe it's the fact that you're serving God, but you still don't love people right. Maybe there's some unforgiveness or maybe there's some bitterness. I don't know what is blocking you, but God has not stopped the blessing. What blocks us is we're not lined up in obedience. Somebody please hear me. There's something right now in your life you are allowing that's an open door for the devil. And that sends in or it blocks God from being able to bless you the way he needs to bless you. better watch your mouth. Praising God and talking to people any kind of way. Praising God and harboring bad feelings in your heart and not loving folks. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, they shall know us. They shall know we belong to him by the way we love other people. Can I prove it to you that some of us don't know what love is, especially in this divisive Divided world that we live in, this judgmental world we live in, in this world where we think we seem to have it all together. We can judge other folk. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. My, the color of my skin, my sexual preference, my gender, my choices, my political affiliations should not be what you look at to love me. You should love me because I'm more than those things. A lot of times we judge people by stuff that has nothing to do with God saying we should love them uncompromisingly. Come on here. That's where the church misses it because we don't realize God can't pour blessings where we're just as hateful or mean as the world is. So what God is saying is you got to love me just because I am a creature. I am one, excuse me, I am a creation of God whom God says you love me for me. Don't love me by my choices. Don't love me because of my choices. Love me because God commanded you to love. Watch the blessings start flowing in your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When you stop judging other people, that's what you're doing. You're picking out their list, but you got to list yourself. And so God said, we got to stop that. And so it says that Hezekiah popped up. If you go to the first uh, verse of chapter 29, you find out it gives us the background of Hezekiah. It said that he was 25 years old when he started to uh, rule. He reigned for 29 years. His, my, his mother's name was Abijah, the uh, daughter of Zechariah. And it says that he was a good king. Watch this. And he did right in the eyes of the Lord. 
That's the difference in Hezekiah and the rest of the kings. He did right in the sight of the Lord. Our first point is you got to keep working with believing. Look what it says. It says that King Sennacherib in Assyria came against them. And if you read down through verses 1 through 5, you'll find out that this scenario took place. Hezekiah didn't stop to say, woe is me. He didn't stop to wonder why God was letting this happen. He didn't stop to sit down and mumble and cry and complain. No, the Bible said Hezekiah kept doing what he was doing. If you go back to chapter 29 when he shows up, he starts a revival. He starts reviving the worship of God. He tears down the high places. He brings God's people back into alignment with God. He starts getting the priestly order back together. Read the verses 29 through 30. Before we got to chapter 32, we find out Hezekiah was doing work because he wanted to bring God and the worship of God back. And he kept on working. So here's what happened. A, an overwhelming situation came, but he didn't stop. He did not quit. He kept on working so he could understand what God wanted him to do. You know what Hezekiah did? If you look at the text, it tells us that the king came against Hezekiah, Sennacherib, and I believe there's a lesson there for some of us. Uh, please, I believe that you are a magnet for the enemy to come against you when you're doing what's right. And that's a sign to you that God is getting ready to bless you. So what I need you to understand is you have to be prepared for your next battle. You're not going to be able to serve God and everything's going to go well. Quit being shocked when a battle shows up. It blows my mind that we're in a battlefield. We're fighting to serve God. We're supposed to. We know that this world is not our home. And we get so stuck. And so messed up when a battle comes. You have to be ready for your next battle. Some people tell you, don't take it personal. I take it personal when the enemy attacks. Because it's me. He's trying to slow down what I'm supposed to do for God. And I don't have a whole lot of time to do it. So I make sure the enemy knows that I'm going to get back to doing what God said. But you need to understand, you got to get ready for your battle. What do you mean, Pastor? Don't listen to these preachers telling you nothing's supposed to happen to you. And you're not supposed to go through. Listen to me. God would never have put in the Bible, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on me if you weren't going to have a challenge with your peace. God would have never put in the Bible that when you lay down, don't be afraid because your sleep will be sweet if you weren't going to have a problem with your sleeping. We get all upset with sleeplessness and don't have no peace. And death. All God is saying is just be ready for your battle. The battle is coming. So what do I have to do? Hezekiah did four things that will bless you. He did four things that takes us into what he did. And if you look at, as soon as the king showed up, he said, I don't know why God would show up now. I'm doing the best I can. He stopped and said, well, let me get prepared. He started fortifying. So he was doing what he was doing. Don't miss this. But he started fortifying his life against what the enemy was doing. You got to make sure that whatever attack comes against you, that's the attack that you prepare yourself for. I just said something. Many of us want to walk around with this general kind of worship to God, get in trouble, and then holler out some stuff. God said, no, be more specific. Go back in your life and fix up the stuff that's being messed up. Look what he did. First of all, Hezekiah said, let's cut off the springs of water. Let's block them off so that all the water is in the city. But when the vast army of Assyrians come, they will have no water because the water is our weakness. Hallelujah. The water is a weakness. So the first thing I got to do is fortify my weaknesses. If you know there's a weak area in your life, that's the area that you need to learn how to fortify because our weakness is where the devil attacks. And don't tell me you don't have a weakness because all of us have a weakness. Watch Samson. Samson fell because the enemy knew that his weakness was lust and pretty women. So what they do? They threw Delilah at him. What am I telling you? That you need to understand that if you know there's a weak area in your life, 
That's the area you got to fortify to stop the attack that's coming now. Mm, I can't say this like I want to. You, you can't just run around each Sunday worshiping and each day praying and act like you don't know you left a door open. Close it. Close the door of pornography. Close the door of nastiness. Talking any kind of way to people. Close the door of not serving God or giving God what he needs. God gives you everything and you don't tithe that. Close the door that makes a weakness in your life. And learn the attack that's happening. I'm not going to be able to stand because my weak area is the area where the attack is going to come from. All I'm saying is we all have to worry about our weaknesses. Not only did he firm up the weak areas, I like this, Hezekiah said, what you need to do is get all the folk together after we take uh, the water down. And he said, I'm going to strengthen myself. And the text said he strengthened himself in the Lord. Very important. Most of your battles are going to be fought alone. It's good to be around people and get cons consolation and, you know, be consoled by other folk. But do you know that you're going to have to learn some self-control when you're alone? You're going to have to learn how to get your own self up for the fight. David encouraged himself in the Lord. you got to find ways when the enemy attacks to be on top of your game. You know what he did? It said he strengthened the walls. Then he built an outer wall, strengthened the outer wall, and put another wall up. The word of God will strengthen the walls where the enemy is attacking. Man, put some more word on it. Whatever the area is that you need to strengthen yourself, you will pray one time. Pray in the morning. Pray again 12 o'clock. Pray again 5 o'clock. You are praising God. Prayer and praise can knock the enemy out of the way. You need to understand that whatever you do, you got to encourage yourself. Then it said he made more weapons. I'm telling you what he, what he had to do when he was saying, he, you know, he strengthened himself. He made weapons. He made weapons, and he said he got more weapons. You need to put on the whole armor of God. We have weapons as saints that we don't use sometimes. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Great, tell you about the weapons God has given us. Come on, you got them right there at your disposal. I'm not even talking about putting on the breastplate, right? All that we know. Put on the forearm of God. Or here are some weapons God has given us that we need to be blessed by. The, one of the biggest weapons we have is prayer. Prayer changes things. Not traditional ceremonial prayer, but prayer is a word that goes to the throne room of God, and God sends down reinforcements when I pray. Sometimes you need to just stop what you're doing, get on your knees, and talk with that privilege of prayer. Prayer is the strongest thing we can do. Prayer tells us, tells God that we need him, and he's given us the privilege of prayer. The other weapon is praise. The Bible said God inhabits the praises of his people. I'm one of the kind that say you ought to break out sometimes. Just, don't wait till you get in kind of formal setting. Just begin to praise God. Do you know that singing praise songs to yourself, anybody ever did it? Start singing praise songs to yourself. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you start singing praise songs and lifting him high, maybe some of those good old songs or, or a new song, I don't know what you sing. Sometimes when I'm sitting alone, I might start off with, I need you all. When you start singing, I need thee, something happens on the inside of you. Because we're, we're praising God. And the Bible says God sits down to listen. You know what? There's a lot of you in here since the church closed. You haven't praised God one time. You haven't figured out that even if you're sitting in front of your computer or TV, you ought to lift your hands and begin to worship. Because praise separates us from the earthly spear, takes us into the heavenly. I got to keep going. Not only the weapon of prayer, the only weapon of praise. Here's a good one we forget about. The weapon of I'm your child, Lord. What are you talking about, Pastor? We love to quote Isaiah 54, 17. You know the verse. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. We love that. And that's what it says. But did you know the second half of that verse is where the real power is? Because it tells you why the weapon won't prosper. It says, and every tongue that rise against me shall be cast down because this is the heritage 
of the servants of the Lord, and his righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Did you catch it? Our heritage is to walk in victory. That's your heritage. Your, a heritage means my birthright. When I became born again, is to walk in victory. So you need to know that I have a right to victory. You have a right. It's your birthright to be delivered. Because God said the righteousness, that means his power, is of him. And the last weapon, of course, we know is the name of Jesus. So what did Hezekiah do? Why do we need to work and believe? Here's why. Because there's a God part and an our part. Follow me. The God part. To every deliverance, there's a God part and a your part. Maybe somebody hasn't been delivered because you haven't been doing your part. God always does his part. Make it scriptural. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. If you look at every miracle in the Bible, you'll never find a miracle because God has said, I don't know why, he chooses to have us a part of our deliverance. He doesn't need us, but he puts us in our deliverance. Check the Bible. When God went to raise Lazarus from the dead, he told them, before he went there, rolled a the stone away. Now, God had no power. He could have rolled that stone away himself. Why? He needs us to participate in our miracle. Remember when he spit in the blind man's eyes? And the Bible tells us that he told the man, look, he spit in his eyes. He could have touched him and said, you're healed. He said, go watch in the pool of Siloam. Why did God do that? Because God wants us to participate. The woman with the issue of blood, she had to touch the hem of his garment. I believe God could have healed her before. He knew she was in the crowd before she even got close. But he said, you got to touch the hem of my garment. Every miracle in the Bible, everything God chooses to have us to be a part of the deliverance of what's going on. I love that because there's a God part and an our part. And not only is there a God part and our, our part, here's the part you need to understand. And I'm going to quickly go to the second point. You need to understand that you have to have confidence in your confidence about God. All right, guys, that sounds tongue tied. I'm going to clean up for you. You need to have confidence in your confidence about being able to get a prayer through to God. You can't depend on the preacher you watch or, or who you. You got to have confidence fact that I am close enough to God to get a prayer through. Here's what Hezekiah said. You got to have confidence because Hezekiah had to have revival because God's people weren't close to God anymore. Sounds kind of oxymoronic, but you can be God's child, but you spent, maybe you spent the first six days of this week not worshiping God. You turn something on because it's Sunday. I know. So you're not really close to God. So when the enemy strikes, you don't have confidence that you can handle it because you haven't prayed enough. You haven't been with God enough. You haven't been close enough to God. So you don't know what is going to happen. So you don't have confidence. So you got to keep working so you can get close enough to God to have confidence in God. There's a story that this, and all of us can fall off. We got to make sure we are there now. There's some days, come on, tell the truth, I'm closer than I am other days. There's a story of a young girl who went to join the church after a dark life of the botcherous living. She did all kinds of stuff. Some of the stuff y'all did, excuse me, we did. And she found herself coming and the deacon was letting her in the church, you know, filling out the information, said, well, um, have you committed sin before you came to the Lord? Dumb question. She said, yes, I, I, I was a big old sinner. He said, well, since you came to God, have you still been sinning? And the girl said, well, yes, I'm, I'm still a sinner, but I'm a different kind of sinner. He said, what do you mean? She said, I, it's hard for me to explain, but let me explain it to you. See, before I got saved, I was actually running to sin. I was running to do whatever I could do. Now that I'm saved, I'm running from sin. And the deacon thought about it and let her in the church. See, I said that because most of y'all, holy rollers, most of us, because we got a Bible, most of us, because we just said a prayer, think that we're not, we don't have to run from sin, and that's why sin catches us. You got to run away from sin. There's some sins that have caught you, and they've grabbed you, and they're part of your salvation, because you haven't, there's some sins I got to run from. Can I get a witness? There's some sins, even now, as long as I've been saved, if I see them, I'm going the other direction because they still can grab me if I don't hold on to God. James 4 and 7 and verse 8 says, 
draw nigh unto God, and he cleanse your hands, you, you evildoers, and draw nigh unto God. He will draw nigh unto you. Watch this. God's saying, the closer you get to me, the closer I'll get to you. Stop what you're doing. You get to me. I'm waiting on you to get close. I like the story of the man and woman driving down the road when they used to, when they were first dating. God would drive and she was hanging all over him and hugging him and you know they ride down the road and then as they got in their relationship they noticed that she wasn't leaning as much she was just sitting and then this spilled over into the time they weren't in the car then one day she just got upset and said um, I'm just mad we don't love like we used to we're, 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 we're not as close as we used to be and the husband looked over at her from his same driving position and said, I'm still in the same position I was in. You just moved away. That's what God says. God said, I'm still here. I've been waiting on you. If you, if you go to your, your secret closet, I'm still standing in your closet waiting on you. All you got to do is make some time for me. And then he said, not only is there, keep on watching. He said, keep trusting, but watch out for tricks. He appointed military officers. Look at verse 6. Appointed military officers. Come on, stay with me in the text. He appointed military officers. And it says, then he encouraged the people, telling them, don't worry. Here's the core of our text. That he that is with us is more than he that is with them. With them is the arm of flesh. With us is the anointing of God. What's good about that is, I don't think any of you doubt that. That's not our problem today. Uh, I, I could spend time on telling you and encourage about the faith and having faith in God. I don't think that's your problem because most of you believe that God is able. Let me prove it to you. If I were to say to you, is God stronger than sickness? You would say yes. Is God stronger than poverty? You would say yes. Can God help you out on your job? You would say yes. Is God greater than the storm you're going through? You would say yes. The problem is it's not whether you believe God. The problem is being able to hold on, like I told you earlier, to know that the odds are against me and things keep getting worse. But I still believe that the odds are in my favor because the problem is you got to be able to handle the tricks. There it is. You trust him, but you get tricked. Oh, watch it. Sennacherib sent. One of his servants, after they had seized and put a big army in front of Jerusalem. And then he sent one of his servants to shout up. Here's what he did. He started shouting, who's going to save you? Can I come back up for a minute? The devil doesn't come himself because the devil's not omniscient. So he sends demonic forces against you as soon as you take a stand. So here you are standing, and the enemy comes with intimidation. The first thing he said, if you look at those verses, he said, um, let me tell you something. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Who's this God going to deliver you? Other, other gods, other nations thought their gods could do it. Hezekiah tore down the high places, trying to make you worship with God. Now watch this. Here's what the devil was doing. I got to make you see this. He told him high places in the Bible were... When Jerusalem and the children of Israel were in disarray, they would just go up to the places where other nations served their foreign gods and build an altar to God and then worship God any kind of way they wanted to. Hezekiah said, no, tear down those high places, come back and worship God like he said in the covenant. So what the devil does is twist that around. You've been serving God good enough. This God just does, is not going to deliver you. So he tries to intimidate you. Next thing he said to him was, hey, now if you believe, ask some of these other nations. He tries to tell you from intimidation to elimination. You better give in. If he can't intimidate you, he'll try to get you to eliminate God altogether. He'll say, wait a minute. It's crazy for you to think God's going to deliver you. He didn't deliver somebody else. Other folk died of cancer. Other folk got put out the house. Other folks' children died. He'll just tell you whatever you're standing on. He'll tell you, get God out the picture. Start scrambling for yourself. And we're dumb enough to fall for the trick to think we can make it without God. He does intimidation and elimination. 
And I like this one. Lastly, when he got you, he starts mocking God. It said they start speaking in Jewish tongue, saying, hey! And they start telling him, if your God was so great, why did he let you get in that situation? It's not your trust that's the problem. It's you falling for the tricks when it's time to stand. When you don't know there's going to be dark days and you're willing to know. Look, the odds look bad, but they're still in my favor. Let me, let me share with you. There's one, one line that can put those tricks down that the devil just said. All I have to do is remember the many, 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 many times God has shown up and delivered me. That's all I gotta do. It wipes out all those tricks because I know you got some testimonies that I don't even know about. I'm telling you all to think about those testimonies. Watch this. So uh, um, there was a story I got from Chicken Soup for the Soul. True story. A young lady sent it in and changed the names because she didn't want anybody to know the names. But it emphasizes what I'm saying, why you should never, ever believe the devil over God. There was a young lady named Angela. She had a best friend named Charlotte. Well, her best, best friend Charlotte seemed to be depressed. As a matter of fact, she was cranky. Uh, she would get into these problems and arguments with her mother and fights with her sister. And when other friends tried to befriend her, they would snap at her. But Angela stayed by her side. And no matter what Charlotte would do, Angela wouldn't leave. And Angela was really concerned about Charlotte's dark poetry she was writing. And it seemed like that summer, when all the kids were together, other kids tried to befriend her, and they couldn't befriend her because as soon as she, they tried to befriend her, they snapped at her. They said, it's better not to be with her. But Angela could be found sitting there with Charlotte. Well, the time came at the end of that summer when Angela had to move out of the neighborhood. So she left and went to a neighborhood across town. And though when she was in the neighborhood, that first week she was outside playing with some new friends and thought about her friend Charlotte. So when she got back to the house, her mom said, Angela, Charlotte just called. And she went to the phone to call Charlotte, but there was no answer. So she left a voicemail and said, Charlotte, this is Angela, call me back. About a half hour later, the phone rang. It was Charlotte on the phone saying, Angela, I got to tell you something. When you called me, I was in the basement with a gun to my head. And I was going to kill myself until I heard your voice. Angela plopped down to a chair. Charlotte said, let me finish telling you. I when I heard your voice, I knew somebody loved me. I knew I, that somebody still cared about me. So I'm going to get some help because you love me. Angela hung up, ran across town, went to Charlotte's house, and they both sat on the porch crying in each other's arms. I said, Pastor, what does that have to do with how I'm going to answer the devil? Because all of us have an Angela Charlotte experience where God stepped up in the moment of our worst despair and told us that he loved us and that's the reason we're still here. Because God, when everybody else turned their back on us, God would not. Come on, we knew that there was love that kept me and sustained me. Is there anybody here that can say there's a midnight hour I'm ashamed to tell anybody else about? But there was a time I would have given up, but God held on to me when I didn't hold on to him. Wasn't God there to love you no matter what? You know what? I got to think of Sunday school teacher, or you better think of parent, that they taught us the greatest truth in the world. And that is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That love kept us. Let me hasten to the last point. The Bible says, not only must you keep 
believing and working, keep trusting, watch out for the tricks. You gotta keep praising and praying and watch the providence. I'm closing, I'm closing. Providence, that's what happened. Look at the text. It says, Isaiah the prophet and King Hezekiah screamed out in prayer and praise to God. When I first read that, I didn't understand. But here's what happened. The pressure of their situation got so heavy that they just went into a prayer and a praise and crying to God, saying, God, I don't know what they said, but my Holy Ghost mind tells me. They probably said, God, these folk talk about you. I'm still standing here defending you. I'm still standing here believing you're going to deliver me. And I believe that made God mad because if you look at the text, it said God showed up. Here's what God said. Uh, you know what? Since you have been faithful, trusting me, even when you knew you were in dark times, even when it looks like and you knew the odds were against you, you kept trusting in me and believing that if I was on your side, I was more than the world against you. Even though you had to cry, you kept on believing. Even though you had dark nights, you got up and read my word. Even though there were times you couldn't feel me, you trusted that I was still there. God said, sit back. I'll deliver you. Look at the text. The Bible said, and God sent angels to smite the Assyrians. Wiped them out. All their big talk. And when he wiped them out, he sent them to a place. King Sennacherib went back. His tail between his legs. The Bible said when he got there, you know, the devil eats his own. At the people waiting, his own relatives slew him. And then the text says, and Hezekiah, and God delivered Hezekiah and the people and they had peace. You know what they figured out? Man, the season against me. I look out there and all I see is odds against me. But then I look up. I, I fall sometimes, I, I doubt, I, I cry, come on, you hear me? I, I, I fear, but I hold on. Because I realize something. With all that's going on in my life, hear me somebody today, the odds of your victory, the odds of your deliverance is still in your favor. Because God is on your side. So no matter how overwhelmed you get, remember the odds are in your favor. This Pastor Duncan is telling you, please, if you're being blessed by this ministry and you'd like to give, I will tell you that last week alone we fed over five, last month alone we fed over 450 people somewhere in that neighborhood. But not only that, we have other services. We're helping folk with drug addiction. They're just, just. All I'm telling you is when you give to this ministry, you're giving to a change in someone's life. Go to our website, www.shallowbaptistchurches.org. Shallowbaptistchurches.org. And you'll find Givelify or you can do PayPal. Give to us online. But everything you get, know that you found safe ground for your money to go. For 42 weeks of pandemic, we never stopped every day from Monday through Friday in early morning devotion. But we believe when Thanksgiving came, we gave away turkeys. All I'm telling you is this church is a church that understands the power of the Great Commission. We don't need walls. We are the church. All we need you to join us. You want to become a member of the church? There's forums online. You can join online. We welcome you here. We've had several people join. God bless you. Follow our Bible study series. And remember, even when the odds are against you, the odds are still in your favor. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help 
Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.